Abraham Lincoln's letter to General George B. McClellan, dated April 9, 1862, is a fascinating document in that it shows how Lincoln could illustrate his discontent without being directly offensive in a letter format, while also paints a very interesting picture of Lincoln's growing dissatisfaction with McClellan. Now for some background, this letter was a response to a letter that McClellan had sent to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton in which he explained how his plans to capture the Confederate town of Yorktown had stalled. The capture of Yorktown was supposed to be the first in a series of towns to be taken in the Peninsula Campaign, which was a plan by the Union to capture the Confederate capital of Richmond through the peninsula which formed by the York and the James Rivers. McClellan had said the campaign had stalled due to the Confederate defenses and also claims that he'd heard from his prisoners of war that Confederate forces were gathering in the city and that their numbers had swelled to upwards of 100,000. Now these reports were false and they were just a trick used by the enemy to deceive the general, and it worked. In actuality, Yorktown was only occupied by about 15,000 Confederate troops. Anyways, Lincoln is writing to his general, hoping to excite him to move, while also voicing his concern over a number of things. Lincoln begins by writing, My dear sir, notice how he inserts dear. Sir, this will be looked at a little bit as humoring the general as we read on. Your dispatch is complaining that you are not properly sustained. While they do not offend me, do pain me very much. Blanker's division was withdrawn from you before you left here, and you knew the pressure under which I did it, and, as I thought, acquiesced in it, certainly not without reluctance. After you left, I ascertained that less than 20,000 unorganized men without a single field battery were all you designated to be left for the defense of Washington and Manassas Junction, and part of this even was to go to General Hooker's old position. Now, McClellan had assured that 50,000 troops would be stationed for the defense of Washington, D.C., but when the time came to pass and he left for the Peninsula Campaign, he had only left about 26, 27,000 troops for Washington defense. And it was Lincoln's decision to move some forces from McClellan's campaign force back to Washington for the city's defense, as he later illustrates, <coughs> sorry, as he illustrates saying, General Banks' corpse, once designated for Manassas Junction, was diverted and tied up on the line of Winchester and Stroudsburg. It could not leave it without again exposing the Upper Potomac and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. This presented, or would present when McDowell and Summer should be gone, a great temptation to the enemy to turn back from Rappahannock and sack Washington. My explicit order that Washington should, by the judgment of all the commanders of the Army Corps, be left entirely secure, had been neglected, and it was precisely this that drove me to detain McDowell. So, right now, Lincoln is blame, <coughs> laying the blame on McClellan. McClellan was complaining that he didn't have enough forces with him to properly take Yorktown and that he was enraged that his forces were recalled without his consent. And Lincoln is saying they were only recalled because you didn't keep up your end of the promise to, to protect the capital. And this is on you. <clears throat> now Lincoln continues by saying, I do not forget that I was satisfied with your arrangement to leave Banks at Manassas Junction, but when the arrangement was broken up and nothing was substituted for it, of course I was not satisfied. I was constrained to substituting something for it myself. And now allow me to ask, do you really think I should permit the line from Richmond via Manassas Junction to this city to be entirely open? 
except what resistance could be presented by less than 20,000 unorganized troops. This is a question which the country will not allow me to evade. Now Lincoln is referring to General Nathaniel Banks, who was originally left to defend the capital from the position of the Manassas Junction, but he was later sent away by McClellan with his two divisions to hold off Confederate forces under General Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley. And although he was later repositioned once again to Strasburg, Virginia, it left a big hole in the Union defenses around the city to where the Confederate forces could march through and attack Washington, theoretically sacking the city. So Lincoln's justifying his move to defend the city as both necessary and indispensable while also saying he was justified to do so because he is the commander-in-chief and that McClellan shouldn't even be questioning this decision because he outranks him. That's the point Lincoln goes on to make, writing, There is a curious mystery about the number of troops now with you. When I telegraphed you on the 6th, saying you had over a hundred thousand with you, I had just obtained from the Secretary of War a statement taken, as he said, from your own returns, making a hundred and eight thousand then with you and en route to you. You now say you will have but eighty-five thousand when all en route to you shall have reached you. How can the discrepancy of twenty-three thousand be accounted for? Now, McClellan had telegraphed Lincoln on this date with the number of his forces being said to be about 100,000. But in the letter written to Stanton on April 7th, he adjusted this number to 85,000. Now, Lincoln's questioning this and thinking, well, what happened to these troops? I mean, did they desert? Did they die a plague? McClellan never explains this discrepancy and this has Lincoln asking that if you don't know how many troops are in your own army right now then how can you be sure if you don't have a force large enough to take Yorktown and Lincoln tries to encourage McClellan to take Yorktown in his next few words writing as to General Wood's command, I understand it is doing for you precisely what a like number of your own would have to do if that command was away. I suppose the whole force which has gone forward for you is with you by this time, and if so, I think it is the precise time for you to strike a blow. By delays, the enemy will relatively gain upon you, that is, he will gain faster by fortifications and reinforcements than you can by reinforcements alone. And once more, let me tell you, it is indispensable that you strike a blow. I am powerless to help this. <laughs> now, Lincoln notes that he is powerless to help this, that he can't force McClellan to attack now. I mean, he can strongly recommend it, but he can't force him to. So he is trying to appeal to him through logic and reason, saying that the longer you wait to attack, the more time you're giving the enemy to gather his forces and to prepare better defenses. So strike now, you have enough forces with you. However, Lincoln would try to spur McClellan on through a little bit of a uh, slight, as we'll see, when he says, you will do me the justice to remember. I always insisted that going down the bay in search of a field instead of fighting at or near Manassas was only shifting and not surmounting a difficulty, that we would find the same enemy and the same or equal entrenchments at either place. The country will not fail to note, is now noting, that the present hesitation to move upon an entrenched enemy is but the story of Manassas repeated. Now, Lincoln is referring to two things here. First, he's referring to his own strategy that he drew up for the Peninsula Campaign, which didn't have the army flanking the enemy as far down as the Rappahanna, as 
McClellan's plan has it. And Lincoln thought that McClellan was wrong in having the forces go as far down as Richmond. He wanted to defeat the Confederate Army not by taking their capital or a number of their towns. He wanted to destroy it by destroying their army. Now, secondly, Lincoln is addressing the First Battle of Bull Run, which ended in a Union defeat due to what was believed to be a hesitancy to advance on the Confederate, pos <clears throat> the Confederate position. Thus, Lincoln is warning McClellan not to make this another fiasco like Bull Run. By waiting to engage the Confederates on an open field of battle and to take a chance and attack their entrenched positions at Yorktown and flush them out. This is Lincoln telling him that don't have this be another bull run because you're afraid to attack. Just attack. Now, despite these provocations, Lincoln ends the letter on a friendlier note, saying... I beg to assure you that I have never written you or spoken to you in greater kindness of feelings than now, nor with a fuller purpose to sustain you so far as in my most anxious judgment I consistently can. But you must act. Yours very truly, A. Lincoln. So, Lincoln is telling McClellan, yes, this is... Um, not in bad blood, this is not in contempt of you, I am still behind you, I will still continue to support you as long as I can, but you have to act now. You have to act now before it's too late. Well, sadly, McClellan didn't take the president's provocations, suggestions, or any such. In fact, McClellan is said that once he read this, he ripped up the note and later wrote his wife about it, saying, I was much tempted to reply that he has better come and do it himself. So, gives you a little hint that McClellan was none too happy to receive this letter and that he was certain that he was right in his designs. But he wasn't, because soon Yorktown would turn into a siege that set the entire campaign behind schedule. They lost their tactical advantages of the strategy, and by early July, they had to retreat out of Confederate territory after coming within miles of Richmond, after a series of battles known as the Seven Days Battles. So, this letter is important because it shows the percolating discontent between McClellan and Lincoln, as well as illustrates Lincoln's tact in incorporating his dismay in his letters.